So, welcome to today's event. I'm not going to talk for too long because the people that you want to hear from are the experts who we have here. Um, so we are here to talk about, well, adhering to water regulations is vital for the industry, um, but there is a question as to how much do businesses and suppliers really know about the certification requirements. I'm sure an awful lot of you know a great deal, but there are many people around who know more than these four that we have here today, and we are here to discuss Reg 4 and the new world that we are operating in now, why it matters. So I will very briefly introduce myself. I'm Richard Price. I'm the editorial director of, uh, of Three Monkey Zeno. We are an agency. We've worked with NSF for, for a goodly while now, and we work across all the markets. We work, we work with them in, in Asia, in the Middle East and Africa, in Europe, and, the, and in North America, uh, an organization that I love working with. Um, and that's why it's a particular pleasure to moderate today. Introducing the more important people on this call. So we will go from my top left. We've got Simon Warburton, who's been, a, he is an NSF International lifer. Believe me, that's a good thing. He's been at NSF International for over 30 years. Um, based at the Specialist Test Lab for Water Fittings and Materials, he is currently the certification manager for the UK market. Now this includes the new services offered for regulation for compliance. He has, over his time in NSF, been involved in every aspect of the business from managing labs across many sites, technical operations and client account management. So Christian, um, also um, internal NSF, um, he's got more than 20 years experience in the wider construction, testing, inspection and certification industry and quality system sectors in water and public health throughout Europe and the Middle East. He's been with NSF since 2014, and he is responsible for guiding the growth of our water division by providing consulting, testing, auditing, and certification services for the industry. On to Kevin, uh, who joins us from Beamer. He, he, he is the heating and ventilation portfolio manager for Beamer, and his role is specifically to look after the member groups of underfloor heating, water treatment, water softeners, and electric heating and hot water. Prior to his time at Beamer, he's held marketing, product management, and engineering roles across a number of manufacturing companies. And last but definitely not least, Tom Reynolds from the Bathroom Manufacturers Association. He's responsible for not only leading the organization into its next chapter, but also representing the bathroom manufacturers industry. He's also a member of the CIPR and an accredited practitioner. So you will see a goodly number of qualifications and experience here. Um, that we have to discuss this uh, this important new development in um, in certification. Right. So, without further ado, I'd like to go straight into the discussion. Um, just to give you the, the the rules of engagement, they are: we will be having a, a series of questions, um, and I will invite each of the panelists to to comment on it. I would encourage you, gentlemen, to. Please talk to each other, chip in as you see fit. You guys have the knowledge in your heads and we're here to try and, and extract as much of that as we can. Um, to the attendees, I would say, please, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat because we will be having 15 minutes set aside for Q&A at the end. Um, and we really want to hear what you want to know and see what you can find out from, from the people who are gathered here today to, uh, to disentangle the uh, the legislative situation. So start off straight away, diving in, start off at 10. I want to talk to you, Tom. Um, and I'm going to give you a very broad question, answer as you see fit. But here's the question. Why do we actually need Reg 4? OK, well, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, and by that, do we mean Regulation 4? or Reg 4, which has become a shorthand used for uh, a number of certification scheme, not least the uh, the one um, run by, by NSF. If we're talking about Regulation 4, it's simply because you have to have it. It's a legal requirement in order um, for products to be installed, that they are fit for purpose in accordance with the water fittings, uh, water supply, water fittings regulations. So legally, you should should have them. If we're talking about that, that narrower definition of Reg 4, i.e. the um, certification schemes, 
I think that, that there's an equally good case for saying that we we must have them. And the the thing that BMA um, feels very strongly is there are so many multiple and very diverse stakeholders involved in the supply of water fittings and installation of water fittings in the marketplace. You have your installers and plumbers, you have your supply chain uh, channel partners into the market, the, the merchants and the, the retailers. You of course have the, the manufacturers with all of their expertise. But what, what's lacking is uh, without the cert certification scheme is an efficient way of communicating that your products com um, comply uh, with those underpinning regulations all the way through the supply chain. And that's the beauty of cert certification. That's why um, as an association, we're very keen to see um, manufacturers seek um, approvals and certifications as a, a good shorthand for compliance uh, to all of those different stakeholders. And when it comes to achieving that certification, for a long period of time, there hasn't been a great deal in the way of choice for how you're going to achieve that certification. I wonder if I can bring in Kevin at this point and ask that question. Is that, a significant, is that, is that of significance as we stand at this crossroads? Uh, I think so. Uh, it's, I mean, it, it's important that we have, that the regulations are in place and that the products are, are tested and uh, comply. But when there isn't a lot of choice of how you have how you get that done, it becomes a bit of a closed shop. So it's it's always good to have a choice. It opens up the options for manufacturers um, and the competition. So um, yes, it's very important that, that um, we have that choice, and this is um, a step towards that where we we can um, choose who we get the get the compliance certification from. Um, I think that that also then opens up multiple um, methods of of uh, getting the compliance instead of a very strict one one uh, one route. Can I ask a question, which is maybe uh, you know a little bit blunt, but where does the buck stop? But who's responsible for the compliance? Can you sell a product onto the market which isn't uh, certified? Yes, you can. But uh, the, the problem comes with um, the, the installation um, and the signing off uh, of, of the product of the product in, in the installation, the commissioning stage. OK, and, and why? So you say you say choice is choice is important. Why is choice important? Is that a financial imperative or are there other um, issues brought to bear? Not so much. It, 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 there are other issues um, speed uh, of bringing the certification through. Uh, development of new products, for instance, um, yeah, you know, there's now more choice of where you put those products um, through the process and uh, and how how you achieve it. Um, it's uh, <laughs> you know, you to have that choice gives you you know, and and each of the people offering this certification will be able to provide a basket or a menu of different ways of achieving it, um, and that's important for a manufacturer to to be able to do that. Some manufacturers have got many many products that will need to go through this process and um, the ability to be able to um, put them together into a basket and uh, talk to people like NSF about how they're going to get them all processed is is really important. And, uh, and Simon, um, in your substantial experience, do, do you have the impression that many people are aware that they do have this choice? Is it widely known? No, I don't think that people are aware of this choice. I mean, you know, as, we, as we've already mentioned, you know, there's only really been one brand in the UK. I mean, I've been uh, in this business for 30 years and there's only really been one brand in that time that, that the market has gone to for, for this type of certification. OK, and su such as the popularity of that particular brand, you know, I won't mention it. People know what it is. But people see it as a mandatory requirement, a legal requirement. You have to have this. Instead of talking about the regulation itself, you have to comply with the regulation. They, they say you have to comply with this brand or have this brand. So, I mean, it's not new, of course. I mean, you know, products are often associated with very, very popular brands. Think about phrases like getting the hoover out or using your standing knife to cut something, you know. I mean, these are kind of brands that become synonymous with the product itself. But how many, you know, how many of these days, how many vacuum um, cleaners uh, suppliers are there in the market? And how many utility knife suppliers are there in the market? Chances are, whilst they're still popular, 
you probably don't have a hoover and you probably don't have a standing knife. OK, so there are often, you know, um, other products that fulfill the same function and sometimes even do a better job. Not always, but sometimes they even do a better job, such as the innovation and things like that, make things, you know, better going forward. So NSF, I mean, why NSF? I mean, NSF has been associated with the certification of products, water products for a very long time. We used to be celebrated our 75th year. So we've been in this business for a long time and we're trying to bring NSF's expertise in certification to the UK market with, with NSF Reg 4. It's interesting. I always feel there is hope for us um, because my mother recently changed from saying I'm going to Hoover to I'm going to get the Dyson out. I think that's a little <laughs> bit of humble bragging, to be honest. I've moved up from Hoover to Dyson. Nevertheless, it means that it means that change does happen. Yes. Um, now, this is interesting. I, I'm interested in kind of the benefits for organizations um, and businesses in in going down this route, but say, for example, Christian, going down the route of working with NSF, is it is it is it time savings? Is it cost savings? Is it, is it a balance of a number of different things? What's NSF's take on this? Yeah, I I guess it's a balance of uh, of uh, everything that is expected from our uh, uh, manufacturer or from our customers. Um, I noted two words that uh, Kevin used: speed and choice, and I think those are. Uh, the two uh, words that we have taken into consideration when we started working on a scheme uh, which could help our manufacturers. And we're not only talking about UK manufacturers because it's a UK scheme, uh, but NSF is a global company. We are present in more than 150 countries. Uh, we have been around, as Simon mentioned, for 70, more than 75 years now. Uh, so we, we know our way around the water uh, and and the, the quality and the safety of, of uh, products which come in contact with drinking water. So taking all this into consideration, listening to our uh, customers, uh, we have designed a product or a service which we feel uh, is an answer for uh, for today's market. Uh, it is evolving because it's adapting to to all kinds of innovation. Uh, it is uh, uh, a speedy uh, service because uh, we are going through a process which is entirely managed by our uh, account managers, technical reviewers. So it's an internal process which is uh, managed in in a in a better way, I would say, in a an optimized way, let's say it uh, in a politically correct uh, wording. Um, and it's also a, a new alternative, a choice that we are giving to the manufacturers. So they have the possibility today to choose whether they want to do their business with, with NSF or with any other uh, uh, organization proposing the, the service. Uh, we think that we have reached a point today where our service, as I was saying earlier, is a real balance between um, a choice that we want to make in terms of uh, speed to market, how, how fast do you want to be uh, on the market, and how much are you willing to pay uh, for, for this service. Uh, and the, the, the beauty of, of the services proposed by NSF is that we have several uh, uh, Schemes in the in the in the uh, initial one, uh, which makes it also uh, interesting uh, for our customers to choose uh, whether they want to go uh, and benefit from the full expertise of NSF for something which brings an additional layer of of quality and consistency. Uh, or to go for what is expected on the market, what is needed on the market, which we can also uh, deliver. Yeah. And, and Tom, I don't want to put you in the invidious position of speaking for bathroom, bathroom manufacturers on the whole, but it kind of does come with your job description. Um, so so to, looking at that constituency, um, is this, is this, is this a, a welcome change in direction, a change in, in legislation to your members? Oh, well, you're on mute. Oh, I got to say it, everybody. Uh, someone... <laughs> Someone had to fall foul of the uh, <laughs> the inevitable, didn't they? And uh, I'm afraid it was me on this occasion. No, I, I mean, I, I think there's a, a rule which applies to all industries, no matter um, kind of what vertical or horizontal you're in, and that's that choice and competition can only be a good thing. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's what we're, we're, we're now seeing emerging in this area of certifications and approvals. And as a, 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 you know, a group of customers seeking a uh, rubber stamp to demonstrate their compliance 
manufacturers are really enthusiastic about the prospect of, of choice and competition between providers. And, you know, they, they will go to a uh, different providers depending on, on their particular needs. Um, and um, I, I think it's certainly a welcome development from, from the point of view of BMA members. So oh, is there something, is there a need to, to publicise this change more or do you think it will just gradually drip through the, through the industry uh, as a matter of course? Uh, I think there's very definitely a need to address some of the mis- misconceptions out there. Uh, I think there's a, a little bit of, dare I say it, group think around where we, we perhaps perceive that there's a, a bigger barrier to, um, to to going to the different schemes than there actually is. So the if you look at the um, who's actually responsible for enforcing the the, the water uh, regulations, which is the the water undertakers within the UK, the BMA is written to uh, to every water undertaker in Eng- England and Wales, and yeah, the vast majority of them have re- responded to us. Uh, confirming that there's not a given approval which they require to demonstrate compliance. You can go to any of the three um, main uh, main schemes and you know they will be deemed acceptable uh, depending on the obviously the the, the particular uh, installation scenario uh, that, that that's under inspection. So you know that as far as the the enforcers are concerned there is that choice in competition whether that's permeated you know, up up the supply chain all the way to to manufacturers. So there's a uniform view uh, among manufacturers that they have that choice, or in the opposite direction to specifiers. I'm not quite sure, but that's where we need to be. Taking aside the slightly terrifying notion of water undertakers, to me as a civilian who doesn't work within your industry, um, <laughs> Kevin, to mm. to that to that question about manufacturers, mm. um, what's the perception there, and is there is there a need for an educational piece? Uh, not amongst the manufacturers. I think it's more more amongst the specifiers. Um, the manufacturers are are sort of keen that um, they have a, have the choice, as I said before. Um, but they're also keen because um, where it, it was a closed um, op- option before, um, they now have a choice to go with um, international companies for their approvals. Now, most most of the manufacturers will have factories around the Europe and possibly around what the world, and it's. It's, it's maybe quite difficult and hard work for them to come and get the approval in the UK. This this now opens up other options with branches of you know companies like NSF uh, around Europe. So it, it, it helps them a great deal. Um, so I, I don't think there's any issue with um, manufacturers. Perhaps uh, perhaps they some of them are still a little old school and sort of still still set in their ways. And uh, you know there's a five year cycle for approvals, and so some products won't come up. For approval for a while so the, the change may not happen for for a few years but um i think uh, there's certainly some the knowledge now that um, there are other options okay yeah and, and there are also options within the options but maybe we'll come on to that in a little bit um, i wanted to move into a slightly different area now if i may um which is which is to talk about the wider policy landscape in which we have a uh, you know, post COP26 and with the general, you know, way the wind is blowing, so to speak, the policy levers that are being pulled in the UK, but but more widely on a global level in regard to reduced water consumption. How does this this reg for legislation change dovetail with that, Tom? Yeah, I think it's a, an Im- important issue to raise, Richard. Um, back in, in the summer, um, the uh, the water minister released a, a written statement to Parliament saying that he intended to bring forward various different policy measures in an attempt to reduce domestic water consumption within the UK. Um, and that that's, um, you know, accompanying some of the other pieces of uh, of legislation and the, the kind of zeitgeist that you mentioned there, COP26 being being a key one. You know, we, we have as a society to start adapting to uh, to climate change and the fact that water resources are becoming more difficult to manage and 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 that is something which is being pushed very very heavily by some very influential stakeholders and governments starting to act and and pull some pull some policy levers so i think we can see further um ideas coming forward this year uh, and into next year what how does that dovetail with the uh, approvals and and certification regime well, you know, the, the the constant drive to be ever more water efficient uh, and, uh, you know, also um, 
more conscious of water quality as well, um, requires innovation uh, from 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 on the part of manufacturers. But that as that innovation accelerates, also the 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 challenge of bringing innovations to market will accelerate. And uh, I think a, a fear that that exists within manufacturing is that there has been a bottleneck uh, around um, uh, approvals in the past. And you know, if we're continue, if we're going to continue at a pace to innovate, we need to relieve that bottleneck. Uh, I think that's where, again, returning to our our theme of of choice and competition, that's really where the the crux of that particular problem lies. Yeah, I mean, I'm really, really keen to avoid the the C word because I think we've talked about the pandemic quite enough. That that's not responsible for everything in the world. In terms of this bottleneck, what's the holdup? It, it's just a, a, an issue of um, the, the, the way things are set up, resource, um, and uh, you know, a, a, a vert by um, a, really a product of the, the level of um, uh, products which which require an approval, I believe. Yeah, and, and Simon, we, we're living in an era of innovation, right? We're, li- we're living in an era when we we embrace all innovation, and certainly within the media, if something's new, it's great, right? Um, and there's a there's a sense that oh you know red tape um, is a drag on it that it stifles innovation. I think that's probably unfair, um, specifically because we the me, the same media that embrace innovation would be the first to cry foul if something went wrong. What's your take on that, Simon? Yeah, well that is very true. I mean, of course, it's fair to say that you know the regulations we're working to are over 20 years at this uh, old at this point, and uh, that is often um, one of the barriers. You know, that's talking about trying to get innovative products to market. Very often, um, you know, we as I say we're working to a regulator specification that's that's also 20 years old, and trying to fit innovative products into um, those testing requirements is, is definitely an issue. So. Currently, that does cause a lot of delay in trying to get those products over the finishing line to get them accepted by um, various certification schemes, etc. So we've got to really work very hard with manufacturers and, and, and push with government and things like that to get these regulator specifications changed um, you know, going forward. I mean, I, you know, I mean, the regulations themselves were supposed to have been updated every 10 years. So we should, by now, it should be on the second cycle of updates. And still no sign that that's going to happen. So, you know, we've got to really look at these regulated specifications and and stop the um, often word for word, black and white kind of interpretation of them, you know, so that we can bring often very, very beneficial, innovative products to market that will actually have a big impact on water use and things like that. But we cannot certify currently because of those regulated specifications to work into. So there's a lot of work there for, for NSF. Uh, Reg for and other certification schemes to try and get these things changed or, or have new interpretations of them, um, you know, to bring these kind of products to market. Can I chip in there, Richard? Yeah, I I I, I think it's important to state that the the three main main schemes um, within in the UK all provide an extremely good level of um, and, and reliable level of um, confirmation. That products comply uh, with the with the um, with the the regulations, but that doesn't mean that the approvals and and certification schemes can stand still. I think what Simon said there is absolutely right, and that there needs to be quite a high level of collaboration between um, the the schemes, manufacturers, um, the the stakeholders, and the crucial stakeholder, the regulator, DEFRA, in order to ensure that interpretation of the regulations keep keeps pace with with innovations as they come forward. Is there is there any question about consistency of interpretation of the regulations? Because, you know, as somebody who was seeking this kind of certification, for, if I was all trying to seek it for my own company, I would think, well, could I go to one particular organisation which might just go a little bit easier on me? Am I being unfair? I mean, we are, of course, you know, that, that is a very good question as well, Richard, and we are working with other certifiers to try and make sure there is consistency of interpretation, because as you say, we don't want to be, you know, whilst NSF um, sets a, a very high standard, um, you know, we don't want to be um, 
having different interpretations to the, you know, other people in the marketplace because because people will just rush to the lowest common denominator, you know, in that case, and that wouldn't be of benefit to anyone at the end of the day. So we want to work with other certifiers to actually raise raise the standard, but have a consistent interpretation you know, going forward. Hearing a lot about collaboration, it would appear that, that, that a collaborative approach is really important in this. Yeah, um, can I can I add something? Certainly. Sorry to interrupt you, uh, Richard. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to use this opportunity also to say that, uh, uh, you know, NSF brings its, uh, its expertise in the uh, uh, making of, of standards and we have uh, long ago integrated the uh, idea of uh, consensus standards where we have joint committees or bring people together around a, a, a scheme and we have them bring their own uh, um, ideas and questions uh, and we have taken this this expertise to the REC4 scheme uh, and for this REC4 scheme, we do have uh, what we call an industry forum, uh, where we bring together manufacturers, uh, regulators, associations, etc. Uh, it's a yearly process where they can, you know, come ask the question that they have challenge us when it's needed. Uh, so the interpretation is not really in the hands of, of NSF by itself, but it's really a consensual decision uh, where anyone in, involved in the uh, in the scheme team uh, can can raise his voice and and bring his uh, his own idea so this is i think very important to to mention it we don't say it enough i think uh, we are not just you know taking a scheme and dumping it on the manufacturers we have created something for them which lives through them so it's it's really important to mention this Again, again, this is, this is the, the collaboration um, point, isn't it? You, you can't really take a, a combative approach if you're seeking to improve the greater good. Um, and Kevin, I, I won't pretend to know a great deal about what, what I'm talking about here, but I, we need to talk about specifiers. How do you collaborate with specifiers and what kind of a role is played there? Well, I think a lot of our manufacturers um, have very close relationships with specifiers. That's clearly how they sell the products. And uh, you know, it's a question of um, as those manufacturers move over to some of these other schemes for some of their products, that they, that they have those conversations and spread the word amongst the specifiers, architects, people who are putting the uh, contracts together for these type of products. Um, and you know, that's something that we need to um, as as a joint group work on to spread that word around it's um, clearly that's the driver for this uh, at, at the other end the manufacturers can only do so much and, and they would have a nervousness if they felt that um, these schemes weren't widely publicized and um, uh, and that their you know their their customers were still sort of uh, looking for the old methods of, uh, of certification so it's important that we do that uh, it's also important that, you know, we touched on a, on a discussion there about uh, DEFRA as well, that, you know, this, this is the time when we, should, we need to go back and revisit some of these test reports and, and get them moved moved forward. You know, this this 20 year wait is uh, is really too long and it's it's another thing stifling the innovation that the manufacturers uh, are, are seeing. You know, materials have changed uh, over the years and you see more plastic fittings um, and some of the re regulations don't um, don't support that so well. I mean, we, we all know the public sector is, is very hard pushed and, and, and stripped to the bone, and we have had a couple of very extraordinary years. But is this a time, um, Christian, when it's quite important for the uh, for, for other organisations, you know, even, you know, NSF being an interesting one, because you've got that, you know, you, you've got that um, DNA of starting as a not for profit organisation, though it's a little more complex than that. Um, but it's organizations that can actually, uh, I'm going to use the word chivy along the public sector to actually make these necessary changes. Should we more, I'll put it better, help them to make those changes. Is, are we living in an age when it's really important for governments and legislators to be supported? I guess, I guess, yes. Uh, you know, there are many changes happening in the water industry uh, and and are happening and have happened in the past years uh, where uh, the, the need for the for the expertise that we have in-house was really sought for 
Uh, we did have, uh, uh, you know, some discussions with uh, governmental agencies uh, about some kind of pollutions and other, uh, uh, you know, contaminants that you might have in the water. Uh, as I said, uh, th th what we are proposing is not something that we are dumping on the on the manufacturer or on the go governmental agencies or water regulators or whatever. It's really based on what we are dealing with with our clients in terms of, of innovation, in terms of, uh, you know, what is your product doing? Because every day you have a new uh, filter, for example, which is uh, saying that it will filter contaminants that you haven't heard of. So it's really important to have this discussion, not only with the governmental agencies, but with the manufacturers as well, with the trade associations, with the associations of manufacturers. So we are all on the same page and we can move together, you know, towards the public uh, because at the end of the day our mission is to serve the public uh, by delivering uh, uh, products and, and materials uh, which will not harm their their health and, and this is in line with of course our 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 public mission and the fact that we started as a not-for-profit organization and we are still today acting as a not-for-profit organization we are really let's say a facilitator between uh, the manufacturers from one side uh, and the end user on the other side, making sure that we are not uh, contaminating or, or or hindering the life of, of anyone uh, down the line. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Christian, you're speaking to us from Brussels today, right? Yes, I am. Yes. So so here, here's a question. You know, we talk, we've talked a little bit about what's being done to increase recognition of Reg4 in the UK. But mm. but as, as Kevin pointed out, you know, manufacturers have very often got, got bases around the world. What's being done to raise recognition of Reg4 sort of more globally? So, uh, again, NSF is a, is a global company and we deal a lot with uh, international organizations. And to be honest with you, when we look at the REC4 market uh, today, we have more customers from outside the UK than in the UK. Uh, so what are we doing? We have, uh, you know, from, let's say, the uh, normal aspects of promoting uh, new services. We have our marketing teams and our communication teams who are working on a daily basis, let's say, uh, to promote Reg4 schemes, not only in the UK again, but everywhere in the world, wherever we are present. All our clients today are involved in the water. You know, they produce uh, materials which are uh, in contact with drinking water and which are potentially exported to the UK. So this is also for us uh, an opportunity to be promoting NSF uh, uh, REC4 scheme uh, outside the UK. When it comes to the UK, we have this kind of, of activities uh, you know, promotional events. Uh, we have the industry forum. Uh, we have different uh, 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 communication events that are uh, being put in place. So I, I guess we are really using this machine that we have for promoting uh, services, uh, and we are putting it at the service of uh, of the Rec4, uh, whether in the UK or or anywhere else uh, in the globe. So you said Europe. I am in Brussels, indeed, but we have customers. Uh, our reach goes back to the, to Asia. We have customers from the US who are exporting to the UK. So it's really a, a global market that we are addressing. Kevin, is that global aspect uh, of significance to manufacturers um, that wider uh, understanding? Yeah. Well, uh, yes, it is. I think the the people on the ground in the UK will be able to to uh, do the educational piece with the with the factories. But it's really important for the factories who can now get a specification in their own language. You know, they can talk to somebody at a at a test house in their own language rather than you know things getting lost in translation and are obviously difficulty traveling to come and visit while tests are taking place and things like that and uh, you know, my own experience of this from the companies that I work for is that, that that's that would be a big major benefit for them. Okay well, I, I'd like to turn to something a little more granular and a little more sort of process um, focused which is Simon can I can I ask you this um, which is we, we've touched on earlier that, that some um, organizations may not be aware of how they can transition from we're not mentioning the elephant in the room but the the uh, the the well-known hoover of this particular world um, how they can transition from that to alternative how can they is it complex is it made easy for them 
Well, it's not complex at all because at the end of the day, we're using the same um, standards and the same requirements for, for the basis of our certification as the, the other uh, schemes you mentioned. So we're using the regulator specification for water fittings um, to do the testing of products, and we're using BS6920 to do the testing materials. And in fact, NSF is, is the only test lab forget the certification side, we're the only test lab that provides testing of both products and materials for the covered mass approval. We, we handle the applications and we handle the whole process. We just don't give that um, badge at the end of the process. So this is why we feel that we can add value by actually giving an NSF certification to, to back up the testing we're already doing. So it's the same testing, it's the same requirements at the end of the day and the end of the day it's just a different um it's an nsf certification at the end of the process and not 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 a different one that we're talking about and say so so if when um nsf reg 4 certification is achieved on a product you will, will the water companies or other specifiers accept it i think there's probably a one word answer to that yeah i mean yes they will uh, i'll give you more than just the one word but they will because we we for some time we've been meeting with uh, water suppliers and in fact you know they have said um and, and indeed tom said earlier they you know wrote a letter to them they have all said basically that they they do not look for a particular brand anymore and they will accept certification against reg 4 which is you know what the requirement is at the end of the day and yes you know um that was always seen as the barrier, you know, the water companies won't accept it, therefore I can't have it because, you know, the water companies won't accept it. And when you're specifying for a product, well, there's no point in specifying for, for a different branded certification because the water companies won't accept it. Well, it transpires that actually the water companies don't have such an issue with that as, as, as perhaps was imagined. It's perhaps more the uh, specifiers just doing what they've done for a long, long time and and not being educated uh, enough that's actually driving that currently so that is definitely where the focus now needs to be Tom yeah Richard I think what we need to do is you know all of the stakeholders that are involved in this retailers specifiers we need to move away from a culture of box ticking which you know the the hoover uh, it, I, I think has been used as a convenient box to tick, you know, putting aside the, mer the very strong merits of, of that particular scheme. Um, but we need to move to a culture of compliance where it's about a a actually dem demonstrating the compliance and ensuring that the, the fittings are, are fit to be placed on the market. Because it, you know, well, whilst, uh, as Kevin said earlier, you know, you can put products on the market that don't have a certification or comply with re regulation for you really shouldn't because they can't be installed and therefore they 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 they're not um sh suitable for the the purposes in which they're marketing and you know re the, all of the channels to market have a grave re great responsibility um to do more and I, i'd like to see us become more of a self policing uh, kind of ecosystem around water fittings as opposed to just relying on 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 that enforcement in quite narrow area of our market. It, it, it remains, a, 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 it, it fascinates me that you don't, you can sell something without <laughs> the certification. It, it seems wrong headed. If you were building it from the ground up, you surely wouldn't do it that way. Um, but of course you deal, you, you, you play the cards you are dealt. Um, I'm going to go super granular with a question now. Um, uh, which jumps out at me, which is, can you just explain to me, please, um, probably, Simon, what is the benefit? To, so within NSF International's offering, you've got Reg 4 1 Plus compared to Reg 4 3S, S3. Sorry, I told you it was very granular. It seems, it's, what is the benefit of, of obtaining one as opposed to the other? Okay. Well, the 1 Plus, as, as we, we call it, is a perhaps a more traditional certification type of offering, similar to other NSF certification schemes. And it includes an annual audit, so a facility audit every year. There will be an audit done on the facility to make sure that the standards are being maintained and the product is still being made to, you know, to the same standard and, and, and the quality is still there year after year. It's not just about testing it once and then perhaps you know, testing it again in five years. So that is 
the traditional type of model. That's a great benefit. But the UK market does not work that way. OK, so whilst that may have been be a benefit to larger manufacturers who have a larger product range, and we'll come on to that in a minute, we also offer the, the S3 scheme for the other manufacturers that perhaps only have one or two product ranges. OK, the and having an annual audit is not so attractive for them, and therefore they're unlikely to go for that. So we want to get uh, the benefits of NSF across the range. We see, obviously, you know, the larger manufacturers, the smaller manufacturers are coming to us for testing, you know, year after year, and we want to actually enable them all to get the benefits of NSF certification going forward. And as I said, with the larger manufacturers, you know, it is a benefit to have the OnePlus certification probably because they have an annual audit, which enables them in, in years time to not have so much testing demands on their product range. Currently, the arrangements are that every five years is a complete start again. If you like, you have to reapply and reprove all your you know materials and everything and then have everything tested again. So under the, the OnePlus scheme, we will have limited testing after five years just to make sure you know we can still uh, demonstrate the product suitability. The S3 scheme will be more like the traditional other schemes out there and will require uh, the full testing after the five years. It's up to the time some of the S3 customers will transition to the OnePlus because they will see the benefits there moving forward and to actually set their products at a higher level and demonstrate a higher level of certification. OK, I've, I've just drawn a, an inference from that. And Tom, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but th this yeah. seems to be exactly pointing towards your moving on from a box ticking exercise. I need to get this particular box ticked. Therefore, that's that. Whereas thinking about collaboration, consultancy, thinking about the evolution of it, having it, it, it of, of Reg4 being something which is inherently useful for all of us, rather than just regarding it as a thing I've got to get. Yeah, I, th I think manufacturers are already on that, that page, really, um, and um, they, they, they see the, the merits of, of certification as an efficient way of communicating all the other things that they do in order to comply with the, the regulation. I think where we, we've got a job to do is educating every, all of the, the other different stakeholders that are involved in this area uh, so that they understand that that's what's coming with a, uh, a Reg4 certification. It's not just that you jump through a couple of hoops to get the, the, the box ticked. Actually, this is about demonstrating real quality and uh, the, the, the fit for purpose nature of the product. OK, which is a very neat and useful segue into the next section, which is I'm going to turn to some of the questions we've had coming in. Um, and and this is this is open to all of you. I want you all to pitch in on this. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it, it's it's on the punchier side of questions, but this is the lived experience of of of, of what's happening. So Andy McLean, um, I hope it's McLean, Andy, not McLean, like in um, Die Hard. Education of the supply chain, um, i.e., suppliers, specifiers, etc. How do we propose to tackle the fact? that a specifier will ask, for example, for RAS, there, I've said it, or a specific scheme and not NSF Reg4. How do you tackle that if you've got people who might just might specifically ask for it? I knew there'd be a pause here, so I'm going to point <laughs> at someone. Kevin. <laughs> um, right, so, so that we need to um, educate the specifiers that um, as, as Andy says, the supply chain that it's 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 RAS or equivalent, or or it's uh, you, you ask for the water regulation. You, you don't ask for it necessarily by name, and that that's that's the key, really, isn't it? It's the same same about everything. You you, you don't go into a shop to buy um, and, and specify I need a Hoover. So you need to ask for a vacuum cleaner. So you know it's about educating the market that that's what, what what's got to happen. But also about um, you know educating the end of this the, the chain there when the when the products are commissioned that actually you know these other things are equivalent to that to, to that anyway you know so but Christian what's NSF doing to educate these people we are doing what we can um, <laughs> it's, token uh, like a politician it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no but it's it's a difficult exercise I mean we mentioned Russ now we can say Russ Russ has been uh, around for 
a long time now and it has become part of the of the scenery so uh, whenever someone thinks about regulation 4 today it's easier to think about trust because specifiers and and everyone d d d do mention it uh, now I, I can I can take an example because I, I I lived it and I don't know if you are aware but the RAS is also specified in some countries in the Middle East um, and uh, it, it was brought there by by British specifier when they went there and they started applying it without asking any question. Uh, and today we have very interesting discussions with regulators in the region there because they are saying, OK, what, what is the RAS? What does it do? Do we have something else that we can propose? Because they understand that uh, uh, it shouldn't be like this. You should have a choice. You should be able to, to select whatever uh, service you want in today's world. We know that choice is, is important. Uh, so what we are doing today is educating. I don't like... The, the word of educating, but but it's what we're doing. We we are promoting the fact that today you have the choice. You have other alternatives to the RAS itself. We're not saying don't don't do the RAS. We we are testing for them. We are a test house for RAS, so we are still involved uh, uh, with them. But we are telling you 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 have another uh, option. Um, Simon described the two uh, schemes that we have. One of them, the S3, is really a, a copy-paste of, of the RAS. So if you're looking for the RAS, you can go for this one. But what we wanted to do was to offer a little bit more. You know, we wanted to offer a robust scheme where everyone will be happy to go for it. And uh, it's true that if we look at it blindly, the S3 uh, is probably cheaper than the OnePlus and cost is important. So if you are a little manufacturer who only have one product, it's probably more interesting for you to go for the S3. But if you are a big manufacturer already working with NSF who have uh, regular audits with NSF, then I can assure you that the OnePlus system, which is a more robust one, probably comes at the same price. So it's not even a question of price. It's a question of what do you want to do and where do you want to go? And the one plus scheme, which involves audit, means that we are guaranteeing as a third party uh, that uh, the manufacturer is following the rules, not once every five years, but every year. You know, they are following up and we are making sure of this. So it's an additional guarantee for the specifiers, for the regulators, because we are telling them, by the way, we are checking them every year. So you you can sleep safely. No one will be contaminated by, by, by what is what, what it is uh, uh, happening there. So, yes, um, to, I mean, to make it short, sorry, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> education, uh, promotion, explanation, uh, uh, and and giving the giving the choice to everyone, you know, to uh, to choose whatever suits them. Yeah, and 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 so, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? The term education feels so one way; it feels mm. almost didactic. You know, maybe raising awareness. Yes, yes. Letting probably. people know. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I turn to you, Tom, man of the people, man of the bathroom people. <laughs> are you are your members buying this? Do they would would they be on board with that perception, or is it quite simply what's the cheaper version? It's certainly not. Um, I, I don't think manufacturers um, as a whole are, are interested in a race to the bottom at all. Um, it, you know, it, it's uh, it's about demonstrating um, the, the quality of, the, of their products and finding the the model which which works for their particular uh, operation. And, and and I think that that's been kind of very well summarised by Christian. Kind of how the different NSF offers and indeed the offers of uh, of RAS approvals in Kiwa. Um, fit around the, the the operation of any given manufacturer. I think just returning to the, the, the point about how you challenge when someone um, uh, is asking for a given approval uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to just demonstration of compliance with regulation four. I'm 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 a great fan of the Socratic method. Just ask why. What well, do they understand why they're asking for that? And I, I think in many cases, the you know the the insistence on on any given approval probably wouldn't stand that withstand that simple question because it would get people thinking about actually why are they asking for it, uh, and is there um, other solutions which provide the the same assurance. Anyone who's ever parented a toddler would describe it not as the Socratic method, but the toddler method. Why? <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, I've got, a, um, I've got a, a question which I want to go to you on, please, Simon. Um, and it is, 
how can suppliers who've used RAS for years know they can trust NSF International? How are products certified by NSF International tested to ensure they comply? Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are relying or we are using exactly the same um, standards for testing. I mean, the testing, when we go through the process for a Reg 4 certification, the testing will be exactly the same. There will be absolutely no difference to what we are currently providing for products and materials. You know, bearing in mind, we are uh, the only test lab that's actually testing products and materials for VAS approval currently. We will be using exactly the same testing. You know, there won't be any shortcuts. There won't be any difference in that. It's just at the end of the process, we will be giving the certification um, to those products if the manufacturers choose to go that route. And we won't be passing on those test reports and applications to, to the RAS uh, certification scheme. So it, it's, you know, that's, you know, the assurance that, the, you know, you have at the end of the day. We're doing exactly the same thing we've been doing since I started here 30 years ago. You know, these uh, the test has evolved a little bit, but, we, you know, we are still the only um, test lab that's actually doing all of that. Uh, but we are also a certifier as well. So we bring in the benefits of NSF certification to the UK market to further enhance what we're doing as a test lab. Good. OK, now. I've got a question from a bigger brain than mine, which is Elaine Coles, um, someone who knows their onions, right? So here's the question, bear with. For PR24, Offwatt will require water companies to monitor embedded emissions associated with the building and or installation of a build as built assets and in infrastructure. Emissions caused by the extraction of materials the manufacture, processing, transportation, and assembly of every product and element in the asset. This will therefore have implications for cost to all points in the water sector supply chain. It's early days still, but does the panel have any thoughts on whether this has implications for regulations, standards, compliance, etc.? Told you she was smarter than me. Um, who wants to go first? <laughs> Tom <That's> does. <laughs> That's, I was worried you were going to say that. That's a big question um, and yeah. uh, a, a very, very, very good one. And um, I think that I, I, we have quite a lot of involvement with the um, the wider construction industry where embedded carbon is um, uh, it's been a topic of, of conversation um, and the, the production of environmental product declarations, which try to summarise the embedded carbon of products have been in existence for some time. How, how that works with the, the interface with um, with the water fittings regulations, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and that, that probably would require someone that's a bit smarter than me to uh, to figure out. But um, I think it's a fascinating conversation and certainly something that um, that we should con continue to discuss. Would you stick your neck out on it, Kevin? What's your hot take? Um, yeah, I mean, it's becoming a bigger issue. Uh, a lot more contracts are requesting this information before they're awarded. So uh, companies, manufacturers are having to look into this in, in more detail. There are um, organisations you can go to to have um, your your business, your, your product range certified. I don't know whether that's something that NSF would look at, are looking to the future for. To, to offer, maybe as part of this scheme, but maybe as part of another scheme, but it is a, an important thing that's that's happening in the industry. And uh, we'll, it's something that Beamer are doing an awful lot with at the moment and looking at, we uh, um, had a uh, meeting about it the other day. We had you know, an open meeting with uh, lots of our members and it's something that's that's really taking their, uh, their interest at the minute because they can see it coming. It's extremely difficult to, when you've sort of been making products for so many years to then look back into your manufacturing process and on, on this on this on this subject it's, it's really complicated you know because you have to you have to really consider every part of your process and factory overheads everything it's uh, quite a complex thing and it's not not easy for manufacturers to do it and i think it's only fair um, Christian, to actually put, put Kevin's question to you, which is where does NSF step into this? Um, for this uh, specific uh, topic, I don't uh, know if we are doing anything, but uh, I know that uh, we are very much involved into uh, different 
aspects of new contaminants as they appear uh, uh, day, day after day. Uh, and we are, I mean, our, our teams are really looking at, at those uh, different aspects and integrating them slowly uh, into the into our schemes. So in terms of uh, accepted levels of contaminants, uh, the, the balance is always uh, moving uh, and it is based on requirements that come from the regulatory bodies, that come from the industry. Again, as I said, we have living standards which are really taking into consideration the world that it's growing. If we take the lead content, which was a big subject uh, for, for several years, uh, we can see that the accepted levels of lead have gone down and down and down, and we are targeting now zero lead in our different schemes. Uh, so whenever, whenever there is something which is um, a matter of, uh, you know, or, or can contaminate public health, uh, we have to take it in consideration. It's not an overnight decision which is taken. Obviously, it's based on lots of research. It's lots of uh, discussions with the regulatory bodies, uh, and then uh, and then it's integrated. Um, here, the question was: Is is it taken or discussed at the regulatory level? Uh, I, I have no information uh, on that at, at this stage, but it would be interesting uh, to follow up and to see if uh, if there is something. Uh, again, the, the REC4 scheme is a living scheme as well. So uh, if tomorrow we realize that uh, the manufacturers, the associations are willing to change some some uh, you know rules, uh, it's always an option for us to to be looking at it. Thank you very much. Right. OK, well, we're coming to the end of our of our session now. Very helpfully, we've got a guest, Paul Daly, who is actually answering the questions <laughs> in the chat. But I'm going to throw this one to Simon, nevertheless, um, just to rubber stamp it with the NSF seal of approval. If products are already NSF certified, can they can that also be used for reg four at no additional cost? Well, we can certainly look at it. I mean, be, you know, being as these are both schemes that are controlled by NSF, we can certainly look at that. The the debate main issue here is that uh, products for, certified for the North American market will be certified based on um, ANSI and uh, US um, standards, whereas we are talking about a UK specific uh, certification scheme here, which is focused on UK regulated specifications. So. You know, whilst you can read across some of those tests, it does become very difficult to actually say this test is equivalent to that. So I don't say no and I don't say never, but at this moment in time, they are separate certification schemes. OK. Good. Thank you. OK, well, listen, we're, I'm going to run right up to the end of the hour here. So what remains is to say thank you very, very much to our to our panelists. For, for the deep knowledge that you've shared with us today. Obviously, it doesn't end here, folks. Um, you know where we are. To everybody who's attended today, you know where we are. And if there are any questions arising from this, absolutely more than happy to answer them. Um, as we've discussed over the course of this last hour, uh, innovation evolves and regulation must evolve with it. Therefore, it is a living thing. We have not, uh, we've not ticked the box. We've simply started the discussion. Um, and when it comes to education, which we're now calling raising awareness because it's more benign, it, that it, it falls on all of us to to enable this. And uh, and last word, the, the word that, that Kevin has mentioned to me the last three times I've spoken to him is choice. Choice is important and choice is what we've got here. So thanks, everybody, for attending today. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye now.